Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing good. I welcome you all to today's session of the Hindu newspaper analysis. The one place where we discuss all the important news stories from the Hindu newspaper both from the prelims and the mains examination point of view. Also once again reminding you if you are facing any issues in your preparation journey for 2024 or beyond UPSC examination we are right here to help you. All that you need to do is fill up the Google form whose link you will find in the description of the video given all that information one of our experts will get in touch with you and have a one on one counseling session with you to help you navigate through your upsc preparation journey having said that these are the topics that we will be discussing from today's hindu newspaper as you can see there are a bunch of topics all of these important from the mains examination point of view the first topic is about why punjab is in the supreme court regarding the central government's decision to increase the jurisdiction of the bsf now as you would remember in 2021 the government of india had announced that the jurisdiction of the bsf that is the border security force in the border states of india would change for example in punjab bsf had the power the jurisdiction up till 15 kilometers from the border the government increased it to 50 kilometers so punjab unhappy with this went to supreme court we'll be discussing what is happening in that case Second topic is the demand from Ladakh on Gilgit Baltistan. What is the demand that they are making? What do they want? What is it that they want in terms of the legislative power? Third topic is the roll out of the malaria vaccine. Uh, recently the context is in Africa Cameroon that is a state they have rolled out the malaria vaccine for children. that begs the question can india also go on the same path because india also has an increasingly heavy load of malaria cases fourth topic is a study from bag that is a bhaba atomic research center that tells about how the indian nuclear reactors are extremely safe they have conducted a study of the radioactive discharge from our power plant and they found all of them to be within the permissible limits from the prelims point of view first india and france have set up a joint surveillance mission in the indian ocean we'll be discussing about india france partnership in the context of the french president being the chief guest at india's republic day parade then the gyan bapi mosque case has again raised the challenge of places of worship act this is in context of the archaeological survey of india saying that yes there are certain remains of temples that they have discovered underneath the mosque that has led to certain groups demanding that the control of the mosque should be given to them then there's a new disease that is spreading in argentina unfortunately the western equine encephalitis we'll be discussing what that is and in the end the trouble for people living in gaza seems to increase even further with britain italy finland saying that they will not be funding the un agency working in gaza because there are news report that this un agency some of its employees may have been involved in the attack carried out by Hamas in Israel so these are topics for today's discussion a very interesting and fun filled session lined up let's begin with the first one so the first topic is about what is happening between the state of punjab and the central government now let's first understand the context of it you all know about the fact that bsf that is a border security force has been given the responsibility to manage india's border with respect to pakistan so india pakistan border is manned on our side by the bsf now for the bsf to work properly they would obviously need certain powers so what powers they had was if this is the border of punjab the bsf within 15 kilometers of this border if this is the india pakistan border within 15 kilometers bsf had a lot of power BSF had the power to arrest people BSF had the power to take up certain cases in 2021 the government of india said that no bss power should increase how much from 15 to 50 kilometers it should increase now whenever the central government gives such a decision obviously no state government will be happy this time around the state government is of the opposition party so they would be even more angry so the punjab government made it a point to contest this now please remember punjab was not the only state in which such a rule was passed it was for multiple states basically the idea was the government of india said 
that right now in different border states like in Gujarat, Rajasthan, West Bengal, Punjab, in different border states, BSF has a different jurisdiction in terms of kilometer. The government of India wanted all of them to have the same jurisdiction. So they wanted all of them to be 50 kilometers, 50. Now, why is it that Punjab has the most issue with this? Why is it that the other states are not saying the same thing? Why is it that Punjab is the only one that seems to have trouble? Well, if you look at how Punjab's geography is, the problem that Punjab has, and I'll show you the map as well. The problem that Punjab has, most of its populous cities, most of its big areas of fertile land, where its economic power comes from, that will come under that 50 kilometer area. I'll just show you the map. We'll come back. Let's look at this map. So if you look at this is the map of Punjab. Up till this, let me change the color. So up till this is the 50 kilometer jurisdiction of the BSF. Now, if you can see most of the big cities, the major cities of Punjab, be it Amritsar, be it Gurdaspur, be it Pathan Kot, Kapurthala, Fazilka, Firozpur, Muktsar, Moga, all these are big cities which are extremely fertile. These cities will be under BSF jurisdiction. Now, if you look at it carefully, when you say there will be BSF jurisdiction, does it mean that the state government does not have any control? Not really. The state government will still have control over it. It's not that that area is taken away from them. But they fear a lot more interference now by the central government. As you all know, the law and order subject within any state is for the police and the police comes under the state government. So it's the state government that owns the law and order. With the BSF having jurisdiction over such a large area, Punjab is unhappy with it. They are saying that in other states, it might not affect them so much. But in our case, it will affect them quite a lot. So Punjab had went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court is still hearing the matter. The next date that the Supreme Court has given to hear this matter is in April. So the matter is still continuing. It will be heard next in April 2024. Punjab has challenged this. Punjab has said that the central government has misused this power. Now, please understand the central government does have this power. There is a BSF Act of 1968. In the BSF Act of 1968, there is a section 139. This section 139 allows the central government to decide the jurisdiction of the BSF from the border till what area will there be the jurisdiction of the BSF. Punjab government went to the Supreme Court in December 2021 challenging this. First, they challenged that how can the central government randomly decide the 50 kilometer limit. Punjab is a small state anyway, 50 kilometer for them would be a very, very big area. Secondly, the Punjab government also said that what is the logic of having the equal jurisdiction of BSF in all the states? Because let me remind you, the central government in 2021 said we don't want to have different jurisdictions. In some states, it was 80 kilometer. In some state, it was 50 kilometer. In some state, it was 15 kilometer. So government of India said we want to have the same jurisdiction for BSF in every state. It is 5050 kilometer. Punjab says that this is not logical because all the states have different size. And for Punjab, as we just saw, all their major town cities, most of them with their district headquarters are within that 50 kilometer range limit. They say that other states might not have this problem. For example, if you look at, let's say Rajasthan. Rajasthan's 50 kilometer limit would mostly comprise of desert land. It does not have a lot of vegetation. For Gujarat, it's the Kutch area, it's the Saline marshes. So again, they don't really have a problem with that because they are not fearful of any interference. But with Punjab, they say that most of our big industrial towns are within this area and we do not want the BSF to have overt control over this particular area. The Supreme Court is still hearing the matter. Again, the Supreme Court will decide on a few cases. The first fact that the Supreme Court has to now question is, does it make sense when the central government says all the states have to be equally under the BSF jurisdiction? Whether all the states have to be treated alike in terms of the local limits. Also, is there a logic behind the 50 kilometer limit? Can the central government just use section 139 of this act whenever they want? That's a question the Supreme Court has to answer. 
this was the map of Punjab as we saw a while back. Now, as I said, the background of the issue starts from 2021 October. This is when the government of India announced that in states such as Punjab, West Bengal and Assam again, I told you it was not just about Punjab. Punjab, West Bengal and Assam, these three states, their jurisdiction of BSI was up till 15 kilometers, it was extended to 50 kilometers. In Gujarat, the limit was reduced from 80 to 50. In Rajasthan, it was kept the same 50. So if you can see in all of these now, the jurisdiction has become the same 50 kilometers. That was the central government's logic that we want to have the same jurisdiction. Also, the BSS says a decision to extend the jurisdiction was taken to give uniformity across all the states so that they know where they can go, where they can actually conduct their operations, till where is their jurisdiction. Now, which is the law that empowers the BSF to carry out its operation and which is the law that empowers the central government to increase or decrease the BSF jurisdiction? Let's look at this. So the BSF Act, Section 139, allows the central government to, through an order to designate an area which will be under the jurisdiction of the BSF. Now, please understand the working of the BSF. BSF does not investigate any case. It does not prosecute any offenders as such. All that it can do is coordinate with the local police. Even if they arrest someone or if they seize something that is illegal. So usually what BSF does, let's say someone is bringing drugs from, pa from Pakistan into our part of the country. Now, the BSF will seize that. After that, they'll have to hand over the material and the person to the local police. The BSF cannot keep anyone in their own custody. The BSF has been given the power to carry out their operation under multiple laws. For example, the Customs Act of 1962, Passport Entry Act 1920, Passport Act 1967, etc. This is what the BSF mainly has to do. And again, the matter is still in the Supreme Court. We'll have to see what the outcome of the matter is. Second topic for today is the demand in Ladakh with respect to Gilgit Baltistan. Now, what exactly is this? What is the demand? Let's first understand the background of the issue. What is Gilgit Baltistan or rather where is it? So when you look at the map of Jammu and Kashmir, you know that a large part of it is Pakistan occupied Kashmir. A large part of it is what is illegally occupied by Pakistan. That area is the Gilgit Baltistan region. So this area. You can see this is the entire map of Jammu Kashmir. Out of this map, this Pakistan occupied Kashmir area, this is called Gilgit Baltistan. Now, what exactly is the demand? If you would have noticed or remembered in the past few months, we have discussed about Ladakh and the demands coming in from Ladakh for a long time. Ever since the partition of Ladakh in Jammu and Kashmir and both of them turning into union territories, we have seen multiple demands from the side of Ladakh. What are the demands? First, the people in Ladakh, the leaders in Ladakh are saying that you cannot just make us a union territory without a legislature. As you know, Jammu and Kashmir has been given a legislature, although elections have not happened there also. But in Ladakh, they have not been given the legislature. So the first demand is that we want our own legislative assembly. The first demand is that we want our own legislative assembly. Second demand, as you know, was to get included in the sixth schedule of the Indian constitution. We know the sixth schedule contains four states of the northeast part of the country. It is Assam, Tripura, Mizoram. Now, if you actually see in this part, the sixth schedule is specifically made for the northeastern states. In that respect, Ladakh has been demanded that we want an inclusion here as well. It right now includes, as I said, Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura, and Mizoram. Ladakh has been demanding here as well. Now, the third demand that has now come up because of which this article is written, they want that they should get territorial control over the Gilgit Baltistan region as well. Now, you might think it's slightly weird to make such a demand because how is it that the central government 
would be able to bring Gilgit Baltistan under Ladakh because again it's not in our control right now it's illegally occupied by Pakistan so the demand that Ladakh is making is at least on paper give us the power that whatever laws or rules that we make will be applicable to Gilgit Baltistan as well so that in the future if and when there is an opportunity that India takes back this area, it will be a part of Ladakh and not a part of Jammu and Kashmir. Mainly this is what their demand is. Because as you know, Jammu Kashmir Assembly still has vacant seats that are specifically for areas of Gilgit Baltistan. Although we don't have elections here, but still there are vacant seats designated for the areas of Gilgit Baltistan. So Ladakh wants something similar to happen in this case as well. At present, their demand has not obviously been accepted by the central government. Again, there are mainly three demands now in total. First, to get them a legislature. Second, to have their inclusion the sixth schedule. And third, to now have their jurisdiction over Gilgit Baltistan as well. Now, there is one more demand internally. If you look at Ladakh right now, Ladakh consists of two districts. One is Leh and the other is Kargil. Now, these two are very different from each other. If you look at Kargil district, people in the Kargil district connect much more with Jammu Kashmir. Their culture, their religion is very similar to people in Jammu Kashmir, the majority of it. So, Kargil is also demanding that they don't want to be a part of Ladakh, rather they want to be a part of Jammu and Kashmir. So, that is another demand that especially people in Kargil have been making. While Ladakh in total is a Muslim majority union territory, the Leh district is dominated by the Buddhists, the Kargil district is dominated by the Shia Muslims and the Kargil district is what is demanding that they should be a part of Jammu and Kashmir and not Ladakh. So again, the recent demand is to have territorial jurisdiction over the Gilgit Baltistan region as well. They have also said that we would want to have our own civil services just like other states have. Just like other states have their own public service commission, like we belong to Rajasthan, we have Rajasthan Public Service Commission, Chhattisgarh, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, etc. Similarly, Ladakh is demanding that they also would like to have their own public service commission so that they can ensure that the government jobs are given to locals. See, one of the things that people belong to tribal community or people belonging to such areas demand is that there should not be outside interference. They fear that being a union territory, central government will send their officers to work in areas such as Ladakh. It will disrupt and hamper their culture. They want the locals only to work in these jobs. The way to do that, as per these people, is to have our own public service commission, make the locals eligible for jobs so that they can give the exam and they will be the one running the entire union territory. Now, if you look at the Gilgit Baltistan region, as I said, this is now under occupation of Pakistan. The government has said, the central government has said time and time again, it is an integral part of India and it will become a part of India one day. The central government has not given a response to this specific issue of Gilgit Baltistan. However, the past demands that were made by Ladakh, they were responded by the central government in the form of making some committees. Like in 2022, government formed a committee under Minister of State G. Kishan Reddy to engage with the people who have formed their own political groups in Kargil and in Leh. Also, the government in 2023 again made a committee under Minister of State Nitinand Rai. This committee was to look into the demand for inclusion of Ladakh in the sixth schedule. But again, nothing has happened beyond the making of these committees. This is where we are right now as of today. This is the Gilgit Baltistan region. Pakistan, in fact, had recently announced that this will be a new province of theirs. Now, please understand this from the Pakistan's point of view. Pakistan keeps on saying that we have given this region autonomy. Pakistan keeps on saying that the central government will not interfere. They will have their own uh, government. They will have their own rules. But in reality, most of the Gilgit Baltistan region is controlled by Islamabad only. Means it is the central government of Pakistan only that in reality controls it. Also, this area the Gilgit Baltistan region is extremely significant for India for various reasons. If you look at the strategic importance, look at the location. Now, this area is where a lot of conflicts clashes between India and Pakistan have hit. This is also the area 
through which the CPEC goes. Now CPEC as you know is China Pakistan Economic Corridor. We have discussed about this multiple times in the past. China Pakistan Economic Corridor is this big highway railway project that connects the Xinjiang province of China to the Gwadar port in Pakistan. So basically this will be a this let me just change the color. So basically this is the highway that China has been building. It will end somewhere here in the Gwadar port. Now this goes to the area of Gilgit Baltistan which obviously India has been objecting to because India believes or it is true that it is an integral part of our own territory. Apart from this if you look at this region it has it is extremely close to Shaksgam Valley. This is the Shaksgam Valley this area. This was the area that Pakistan had gifted to China. Now after 1962 war which China won Pakistan wanted to prove that they are extremely close to China. So what did they do? They gifted this area to China so that they could make Jammu and Kashmir a three party issue. Please understand this. As long as Jammu Kashmir is only an issue between India and Pakistan you need only two parties on the table. But when you include China also here saying that this is a part of their territory it becomes a multi party issue then it becomes a big problem. Pakistan's strategy for a very long time has always been to make Jammu Kashmir a multi-party dispute. They always want someone from the international community to come in. India has always maintained that it's just a two-party issue and there are only two parties that should talk. Anyways, apart from strategic significance, this area also has economic significance because there are proven mineral reserves in this area. There are proven metallic, non-metallic reserves in this area which are extremely important for industrial use. In fact, Southern part of this region has deposits of nickel, lead, copper and zircon as well. But the northern part is believed to be rich in iron, silver, gold, garment and topaz. Because of this area being in the disputed territory, there has not been enough infrastructure projects or enough exploration projects that have taken place from either side. Which is why this area remains extremely poor. The quality of living in this area is not that great and that is why People in Ladakh also want that this should be under our jurisdiction so that we can see a much more developed part of the world in this area. The next article is with respect to the malaria vaccine rollout. Now, people living in India unfortunately know malaria way too well. We are one of those countries in the world that has a very very high caseload of malaria. In fact, there are many countries including India where many people lose their life because of malaria. Now, the problem is, despite the best of effort for the WHO, they have not been able to control the spread of malaria. But now there is a hope. The hope is in the form of a vaccine. The reason why this is in the news is Cameroon in Africa has become the first country to launch the RTSS malaria vaccine for children. Now, this is a part of an effort by UNICEF. They are the ones who are, uh, who are, pushing in the money, pumping in the money for this and they are focusing mainly on Africa because over 90% of the case load in the entire world of malaria comes from Africa specifically. Apart from that, the aim is that 20 countries where there is high case load of malaria would be able to roll out this vaccine in this coming year. Now, if you actually see malaria which is a life threatening disease the numbers are shocking in terms of the distribution of the cases. WHO says in 2023 Africa accounted for 94% cases and 95% of global malaria deaths in 2022. Now it's also because say diseases which are dependent on mosquitoes in some way or the other are directly related to the hygiene apart from the climatic conditions obviously. If you are living in an environment or living in a country which has very low temperatures then you don't really have mosquitoes etc. But when you're living in these kind of countries where the conditions for mosquitoes allow them to thrive plus you have country where the hygiene levels are not great this is where you start having problems such as malaria. In India also the situation not that great in 2022 66% cases of malaria from the Southeast Asia region came in just from India. In fact, in this part, India and Indonesia together made up 94% of the malaria deaths in the Southeast Asia region. This is why 
malaria vaccine was such a top priority for nation around the world including India. India has been making a lot of progress and I'll just show you some of the initiatives by the Indian government as well. But the problem is even today malaria takes a lot of lives which can be easily prevented. The rollout of the vaccine right now, that vaccine is being made by the British multinational company called GSK, the GlaxoSmithKline company. The name of the vaccine is RTSS. The money that is being given to this project is about close to $170 million. There is one more vaccine that will be rolled out very soon and the connection with, with India is that vaccine will be made in India. So the other vaccine called R21 developed by Oxford University. This will be manufactured by the Serum Institute of India. It will increase the rollout even further. Now, if you look at this particular vaccine, the RTA that is being rolled out in Cameroon, it requires at least four doses to be given in children from around five months of age. So very young children, when they're five months of age, the doses will start, four doses minimum, where the malaria cases are very high, where they are more susceptible to falling into malaria, a fifth dose can also be given to them. Also, the challenges, some of them are controllable, that is hygiene, etc. Some of them are uncontrollable because they depend on the bigger climatic condition. Because the mosquitoes thrive in rising temperatures, when they are warm, humid conditions. This is where this parasite properly thrives and this is why it's not possible to control malaria to the last degree in every part of the world. But yes, vaccine can be extremely helpful. Now, there are initiatives both at the global and at the Indian level taken to curtail the spread of malaria. At the global level, for example, we had WHO's Global Malaria Program. Again, remember, the WHO aims to control malaria majorly by 2025. Not in all, but what they have done is they have identified 25 countries where there are high malaria cases, where there is potential to stop malaria. So the aim under this initiative E2025 is to stop malaria or to eradicate malaria in 25 countries by 2025. This is an important fact for the prelims exam because they can specifically ask you E2025 initiative is related to which of the following diseases. So do remember that is malaria. WHO has set a target to reduce global malaria instances by 90% overall by 2030. Apart from WHO, there is also an initiative being run by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which are also focusing on cutting down malaria cases around the world. Now, what's happening in India? India's initiative, especially to eradicate malaria, aims to eradicate malaria by 2030. So do remember that our government's aim is to eradicate malaria by 2030. We also have it included under the National Vector Disease Control Program. We also run National Malaria Control Program. Uh, it has been running since 1953 underway. The government of India takes multiple initiatives such as treatment of patients, monitoring, surveillance of cases, etc. Also, we have something called High Burden to High Impact Initiative. It has been initiated in four states, West Bengal, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, and Madhya Pradesh, where the malaria cases have been found to be high. But again, although we have made a lot of progress, but we are not anywhere near to the complete eradication of malaria in the coming times. Next article is slight bit of positive news after a bit of depressing news of malaria. This is a report coming in from Bagh Bhaba Atomic Research Center. So what they did was they conducted a study of five nuclear or rather six nuclear power plants in India. They saw in the 30 kilometer radius of that power plant, are there any chemicals that are being released by the power plants which can be harmful for the environment or not. The great news is none of these emissions that have been given out by the nuclear power plant are beyond the permissible limit. So all the nuclear power plants in India are running well within the permissible limit, which is a very good news, which also indicates that the authorities are doing their job properly. These are some of the findings. So what they did was the data that they have collected is of the last 20 years from 2000 to 2020, six power plants were analyzed. Apart from that, the Kudan Kudan power plant was only analyzed from 2013 to 2020, because that is when it started to work. 
also it focus on what were the different chemicals that were given out what was the value whether they could measure it or not some of these values were so small they were so small that they were not even being measured by the instruments that we had now what is it that the bark found out they found out that noble gases such as argon 41 radio iodine particulate radionuclides cobalt etc all these waste were studied the study found out that the discharge material from all these fission products are well within the range they found out that the concentration of let's say iodine 131 was below 1 milli becquerel now there are a couple of things here i would like to give you as a homework first and this is not a very difficult homework find out what does this bq stand for this unit of radioactivity so this bq is a unit in which radioactivity is measured find out what does it stand for also this person on whose name this unit has been given this person won the nobel prize along with two other people who were those two so again the first question that i have is this bq stands for what second question that i have is this bq the person won the nobel prize with two other people and again those two are also very interesting he won the nobel prize with two other people which were the other two people why did they win the nobel prize anyways the other part is do you have to remember all this data no you don't have to remember all this data you don't have to remember how many units of big of bq were found out when the bark conducted the study so from this entire article the take away that you need to have is when you are writing an answer about the safety of nuclear power plants especially with respect to india this is where you can quote this this is where you can quote the study by bark that they have found out at least in the past couple of decades there has not been any emission or any discharge that goes beyond the permissible limit also that connects it connects us to one other problem with respect to nuclear power plants the problem of nuclear waste now the problem of nuclear waste is something that no country in the world can claim that they have mastered it the countries around the world are still grappling with this issue the issue is after the nuclear power plant has generated electricity what do they do with the leftover material that is still slightly radioactive where do they store it how do they keep it protected there are various ideas that have come up some countries believe that we'll just keep them in the containers in big go downs but again there is an end to it how much can you keep then there is an idea that okay let's dig it under the ground but the problem is when you dig or when you store radioactive material under the ground it might mix up with the water supply then what do you do some people have said they said let's throw it in the deep ocean but again it will harm the marine life so there is no one single answer to this this infographic that you see on the screen is an excellent infographic in terms of all the information that you need about the nuclear waste around the entire world now again this has a lot of information which i would like all of you to study as you know you can download these ppts the ppt link is in the description of the video download them do study at, at your level but do understand the idea of nuclear waste because again the nuclear waste takes a lot of time hundreds of years at many times to even reduce their radioactivity to the safe level and that is why there are not many ideas that are coming up around the world to suggest how to control and how to get rid of this radioactive waste i'll give you a couple of other interesting facts some people have even suggested why not have all this radioactive waste in a rocket shoot that rocket in the space and let it just evolve like a satellite now this seem like an idea out of a sci-fi movie but it's not extremely safe in fact the transportation of nuclear waste from one country to the other country is also a big matter of concern what the big countries what the uh, big powers do is they try to dump this waste in some far off island some far off territory that they still have under their control so while the nuclear power is a safe and it's a clean way of making energy but the reality is it is still not 100% uh, 
reliable in the form in the sense that we still don't know what to do and how to get rid of the nuclear phase that is still a problem that needs to be solved in the coming years these were the articles from the mains exam point of view from the prelims point of view the first article that we have is with respect to india france relationship india and france have agreed to join or they have agreed to have a joint surveillance mission now something very interesting that you need to understand india france relationship is extremely strong and i'll tell you something why is it so strong and how can you actually prove this see what happened at the republic day parade the republic day parade saw french president as the chief guest now you would remember this the government of india had first invited joe biden that is the american president to come here as the chief guest due to whatever condition due to certain cases his own elections coming up he denied he said that i can't come in now the entire world knew this it was not a secret in fact the american ambassador to india said this in a press conference that yes joe biden has received the invitation he denied whatever may be the reason they were not made public but he denied coming in now imagine if you are india or indian government the first choice that you had as a chief guest they denied now whoever you will go to next they will think oh means i was the second option means i was a backup choice it's also a matter of ego understand this when someone comes to you and says please do this for me because the one person i wanted more than you did not come you would also think twice right that is how egos come into picture but even in that situation french president came in on a short notice and accepted the invitation now this underlines the importance of india french relationship for both the countries please understand in international relations no country does something just to help other country out it they always do something in their own national interest so because france understand the significance and the importance of india that is again an example of how india france relationship has been extremely extremely strong and it is since our independence many people focus a lot on india's defense buying from russia but what we ignore is since our independence indian air force has always been dependent mostly on the planes coming in from france the uh, the recent ones are not the only example of it the recent ones are not the only example of uh, the planes coming in from france the rafales and even before that we have a long history of the planes being imported from france time and time again for france the importance of india is that they understand india's location strategic location india's economic might they understand the fact that india can act as a counter to china and france also if you look at the global politics they also do not want america to be the lone superpower and that is why france has always been speaking up against the unipolarity they always want multiple countries to share power and in that context india france coming together is a good thing for both france is the first major western military power with which india has granted joint patrol this joint patrol is around the french la reunion now where exactly is this let me first show you the map so if you can just see the map this is africa southern coast of africa this is mauritius and just nearby just to the west of mauritius this is a small island called the reunion island this is a territory of france only so this is a french territory now it's extremely important for these superpowers to have territories far away from their home which they can use as an air base which they can use as a naval base as well in fact india france relationship is so close that even india has been given access to this particular base by france now france india relationship has gone from strength to strength there have been multiple initiatives launched between the two sides for example apart from having joint military exercises etc the two sides always cooperate <clears throat> in the sector of space there has been joint collaboration in the making of the rafale planes that we just discussed not just this partnership on making all helicopter multi role helicopter etc HCL from India has been learning a lot from the expertise of the French companies as well. In terms of space, also as we discussed, the two sides have been working closely together. ISRO's New Space India Limited, that deals with foreign partnerships, they have made a partnership with the French organization to have a long-term partnership to launch missions. In fact, 
India in the past already has launched multiple satellites from France. India, ISRO in fact, has been earning a lot of foreign exchange through this activity, helping the other countries, including the Western powers, to launch their own satellites at a much, at a much, much cheaper price. <clears throat> These are some of the other important pointers to understand India-France relationship. France has always been supportive of India's membership at multiple global platforms, including the UNSC, including groups such as the NSZ, etc., the MTCR also. India and France have also had the India and also, France have also had a very strong defense partnership. France has become India's second largest defense supplier from 2017-2021. As I told you earlier, Indian Air Force planes have been deployed to Reunion Island as well, as well. That is a French territory. Bilateral trade has also increased. There is a sizable presence of the Indian diaspora in France. A lot of Indian students go to France. There is a lot of Indians that go to France every single year in terms of tourism as well. France has also been a big collaborator in India's civil nuclear power plant journey as well. The two countries are jointly constructing the world's largest nuclear park in Jaitapur, Maharashtra as well. Although there are some hiccups, the process is going slow, but still the two sides are collaborating. France was also the first European country to accept the UPI payment system for the Indian visitors, Indian NRIs that are in France. All in all, very strong relationship. And this recent short notice visit or short notice acceptance of invitation by the French president to a Republic Day Parade was again an indication of the importance attached by the two countries on each other. The next article that we have here is with respect to the Places of Worship Act of 1991 as all of you would have read about but just a reminder once again. So basically what has happened, there has been a lot of discussion about the Gyanwapi Mosque in Varanasi. The Archaeological Survey of India had conducted a survey. In the survey, they found out that yes, there are definite signs that there were or there was a temple here. And thus, based on this, a lot of groups have now been demanding that they should, a lot of Hindu groups rather have been demanding that they should be given the control of this mosque. Now, in that aspect, the Places of Worship Act of 1991 becomes important. Now, what exactly is the place of worship? Let's try and understand. So, this law was passed when P.V. Narasimha Rao was a Prime Minister. The law said that all the places of worship in India, except the Ram Janbhumi Ayodhya dispute, leave that apart. Apart from that, all the places of worship that we have in India will carry the same character as they did on the 15th of August 1947 means on 15th August 1947 if there was a temple it will remain a temple only doesn't matter what happened in the past if on 15th August 1947 there was a mosque it will remain a mosque only it will not change its religious character that is the law the only exception was given to Ram Janbhumi dispute it was still under the judiciary at that point of time that has also been decided so now people are saying that since we already have this law that no other religious place will change its character how is it that the Archaeological Survey of India has given this finding? How is it that the other side is demanding that now they should be given control of this mod? This is where the question is. So what happened was when Archaeological Survey of India was about to start their investigation into the Gyanwapi Mosque, there was a challenge in the Supreme Court. The challenge was that Supreme Court should not allow the Archaeological Survey of India to carry on their investigation. But the Supreme Court said that no, the law of 1991, the Place of Worship Act should remain as such. We are not saying that it should go away, but the survey should be conducted. The side that represents the mosque opposed the survey. They said this is like salami tactics. Salami tactic is especially a phrase that is used for China. For example, if this is the India-China border, this is India, this is China. So rather than occupying a large territory, what China does is slowly by slowly they start occupying very small territories. And before you know it, after some years they would have occupied a large territory. This is called salami tactic, basically taking and slicing out very small territories. Anyways, so Supreme Court had allowed the survey to be carried out. They had said that it's a matter of faith to the Hindus and the survey should be carried out. Now that the survey has carried out, now that the survey has said that yes, there are 
concrete signs that there was a temple here. Now the question is what will happen? Because we already have the place of worship at 1991 that says that the nature of the religious place cannot change. It will remain the same as it was in 15th August 1947. In fact, the Supreme Court also had said that this law has a status of being a basic structure of the constitution. Would it now mean that the law under which the religious character cannot be changed would be removed to change the ownership of the mosque or would it be the Supreme Court's verdict or would the Supreme Court say that no, whatever Akhilavya Salva of India has said that is a site but the mosque will remain as it is. That is the question right now. Now, the Place of Worship Act of 1991, as I said, has these main sections. First, it prevents the conversion of a place of worship from one religious domination to the other. As I said, the, any place of worship will have the same character as it was on the 15th August 1947. It also says that exception has been given to the Ranjan Bhumi Babri Masjid issue in Ayodhya because that was still under the judiciary. Also, it does not restrict any survey from being carried out in the archaeological sites, ancient monuments, etc. It is again repeatedly said by the Supreme Court, it's a part of the basis such of the constitution. But how is it dealt with in the coming weeks and coming months? That remains to be seen. <clears throat> the next article is about a disease that is breaking out in countries such as Argentina and Uruguay. This is called the Western Equine Encephalitis that is being spread. Now many humans have also been found to be uh, uh, to be ill with this. This is a vector borne disease. So it's a mosquito that is spreading the disease from animals to the humans. Again, this is a disease that originates in the animals. The WHO has already given a notice to the country, especially in South American region to be aware of this. On 20th of December, the International Health Regulation National Focal Point in Argentina had alerted the WHO that we have a new wave of these kind of cases coming up of this virus spreading. This Argentina and Uruguay are the two countries where most of these cases are reported right now. Again, this is not the first time this disease has come in the news. It had earlier spread to countries such as US and Canada where over 3000 cases were reported earlier. Now, this is a disease that is caused by Western Equine Encephalitis virus. The main host of this virus is considered to be Pessarine birds. How does it get into the humans? Again, through the vectors, that is mosquito. So, basically they act as vectors, means they bite these birds, carry these virus in their body, the same mosquito then bites the humans and that is how that virus gets transmitted. So that is how they act as vectors. There have been 374 cases right now in Argentina and Uruguay. Again, it has only been restricted to South and North America for now. It has not come into this part, but again, we have to be careful. In Uruguay, there have been 56 cases so far and no human to human infection. So at least right now, there is no direct human to human infection as we saw in the case of COVID-19. When you don't have human to human infection, you at least can limit the spread of a disease when it's through only vector. But when you have human to human infection, when the disease spread from one human to the other, that is when it becomes uncontrollable. The last topic for today is that many countries around the world, including Britain, Italy, Finland, have decided to stop giving funds to the UN agency working in Gaza. Now what is happening? The report has come out under which certain employees working in this UN agency in Gaza called UNRWA that is UN Relief Work Agency for Palestine. Some employees of that agency were involved actively in the attack carried out by Hamas in Israel. When this report came out, these countries said that we will not be donating to this agency any further. That is why this topic is again in the news. Now, if you look at what the side of Palestine and Palestinian supporters is saying they are saying it's a conspiracy by Israel. Israel is the one that has fudged up this report and they don't want any funding to go into this area for any relief purposes. As you all know, we have discussed this earlier as well. The deadly attack by Hamas was carried out in Israel on October 7. 
and members of UNRWA that provides education and aid services to Palestinians in Gaza, West Bank, etc. are believed to be involved in this. As per the reports, about 12 of these employees are involved in the cross-border attack and that is why many countries have said that we will not be giving funds to them. Now, a bit of detail about this UN Relief and Works Agency. It was established in 1949 to work in specially to work for the favor of the Palestinians <clears throat> that have been displaced and have been living in different countries nearby that particular region. It focuses on education, healthcare, relief, infrastructure building, etc. They help refugees living in Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, West Bank, East Jerusalem, and on the Gaza Strip as well. They are funded completely by voluntary contributions. Countries contribute to this out of their own goodwill. That is how this agency works. And now those same countries are saying that we will not be giving funds because it seems to be involved in these violent activities. This brings us to the end of today's session of the Hindu News of Analysis. I hope we added some value to your preparation. Again, a couple of very quick reminders. Number one, the Google form is waiting in the description of the video. You have to fill that up in case you want a one-on-one -on -one counseling session with our experts. Also, there are a couple of practice questions which you can write answers to. Submit on the student answer writing portal. It's a portal where students can write answers and you can check each other's answers, give feedback to each other. The link for that portal is also in the description of the video. I'll see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good day ahead. Bye-bye. Jai Hind.